Hello, and welcome to a special report from Channel 781 News. Uh, today, we're joined by two members of Brandeis Leftist Union. If you could say hi, uh, Jaden. Hello. And Ellis. Hi. Um, so I first met Brandeis Leftist Union uh, in its infancy uh, when the 2020 George Floyd protests were going on. Um, and they, uh, the group quickly integrated itself into uh, Food Not Bombs, which is a group that I help lead in the city. And, uh, and we've been working together ever since. I think it's a great group. But they're here for a different reason uh, today. Um, could you please describe VOU in your own words? And then we'll get to uh, telling us about Harvest Table. So BLU stands for Brandeis Leftist Union, and it really, our overarching goal is to build kind of revolutionary um, leftist potential on campus here at Brandeis. But um, more than that, we kind of are hands on in doing um, Who Not Bombs and in reading groups and education. Um, and in this podcast, we're kind of going to talk about our work with the labor union and the dining workers at Brandeis. Aiden, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, so um, Ellis and I are both seniors at Brandeis. We've been with BLU since its inception, our sophomore year. Um, and yeah, we're really dedicated to creating a formation of student worker power and alliance on campus. Um, to be able to fight against the administration in any campaigns necessary. And then also in general, just providing a space for revolutionary education within the college campus, since that is a um, realm of education that is often lacking in institutional universities. These past month about um, since literally just the beginning of this school year, we have been really involved in an emergency campaign um, due to the unjust firing of a black catering worker um, by our new dining vendor who just began this year, Harvest Table. And so once that firing took place, um, BLU immediately, we had a prior relationship with the catering worker who was fired. Um, he'd been involved with BLU campaigns last year when we were organizing around um, ensuring that the union, the dining union contract got upheld within the shift of dining vendors that was taking place. And he was very involved in that, um, very active politically. And so we immediately jumped to help him secure his job back. So, uh, I guess, I guess we should back it up just a little bit. Um, so Brandeis used to be, have a con used to have a contract with Sodexo, mm -hmm. um, and I remember when BLU did a bunch of work around uh, Sodexo as well. Um, now there's Harvest Table. And so contract negotiations are still going on. Can we go into uh, what happened after they were fired? So after Kevin's was fired, the catering worker, um, he reached out to students directly. And we, a couple of um, student organizers, wrote a petition to get him reinstated, but also to look into the systems Harvest Table has in place to even allow this um, to happen, even to allow unjust firings, miscommunication, and um, unprofessionalism from their management to occur in the first place. Um, that petition can be found on the BLU Instagram and in the link tree. Um, but that petition was spread around and has gotten over 600 signatures now. Um, and we presented it to the executive director of Brandeis Harvest Table. Um, and that's there's more on that, I think, later. Yeah, so... Um... Like Elle said, this has all been like an emergency campaign because someone's livelihood is at stake. Kevin's has now been out of a job for many weeks. And so this wasn't a campaign that we were able to take our time on at all. Um, and so the second that we decided that a petition was the way that we wanted to start this, um, we tabled for three days straight. And within those first three days that the petition was public, we got over 500 signatures. Um, which if you know Brandeis, we're not a huge campus. That's a lot of people on our campus. So it was really clear that like the students know who this worker is. 
the workers, obviously, this is their peer. Um, he's been with Brandeis for eight years. Yeah. yeah eight years. Um, he's like really loved as part of this community. And so we created the petition, which, um, as Ella said, community members can sign it as well as students. So if you're interested in signing it, it is in the link tree in our um, Brandeis Leftist Union Instagram. Um, we'll, we'll include the petition as well. Awesome. And so, yeah, a group of student organizers, we printed the petition and we went to go deliver it to the general manager of Harvest Table. Um, Before that, um, can I just add that please. we also did two delegations, student and workers showed up to the dining halls to demand to show their support for Kevin's and to demand that he get rehired and um, during these delegations workers really emphasized Kevin's reputation and um, him being loved by the community, but they also were um, very like very insistent on saying that it's like very clear that Kevin's a hard worker. He cares a lot about his work and catering. Um, and so like that's just how he was known around the community by workers and students. And so the fact that he was even hired is complete. He was fired, my bad, is um, completely unprecedented. And like it's really important. Another important aspect is that Kevin's was fired with complete disregard of the progressive discipline that has been outlined in the union contract that has been signed and adopted by Harvest Table and which they have legally agreed to follow. Um, and so not only was his firing unjust, but it also goes in complete contradiction to that contract, which we campaigned for really hard last year to make sure that that union contract stayed adopted and stayed in place within this switch of vendors that just took place over the summer. Um, so that I think was also like pretty monumental to both us and the workers, because it was like if Harvest Table can fire Kevin's out of compliance with the union contract, they could do a lot more things as well out of compliance. Um, and so other than being sad and upset about Kevin's firing, there's also, I think, a level of fear that came out of it as well. And just to say something about progressive discipline, um, when I first started on this campaign, I didn't know exactly what that meant or what it looked like. But in the union contract between Harvest Table and the worker in the union, um, it is very explicit about the level, the level of escalation that Harvest Table has to go through before they can fire someone. And I'm pretty sure it includes multiple warnings, um, multiple conversations with managers and executive directors before someone can finally get fired. And all of those steps were ignored and Harvest Table instead directly jumped to firing Kevin. So yeah, just highlighting what Jaden said, there definitely is a fear around if this happened to a coworker who was so hardworking and cared for his job, this could happen to me. Absolutely. Um, so you collected all of these signatures um, on this petition and uh, attempted to hand it over to the president, whose name is what again? Clayton. So we oh. handed it over to the the general manager or the direct. Um, He's like the highest position at Brandeis, Clayton Hargrove, but then their CEO and founder is Mary Thornton. Clayton Hargrove, how did that go? So yeah, so we had organized a delegation, which was the second or third one that we were having to raise awareness, the second. Um, so uh, we have two dining halls on campus. There's Sherman and then there's Usedan. So we advertised this delegation meeting at USDAN. Um, it was a rainy day. We still got a turnout of students and more than students, workers really, really turned out for Kevin's. Um, we chanted, we went around. Um, Clayton's office we know is in USDAN. And so we went to his office. He wasn't there, which- Conveniently. Yeah, conveniently. 
And then we were told by workers that not only was he not there, but that they had seen him leaving his office to go to the other dining hall, Sherman, just 10 minutes before our delegation started, which was publicized. He knew it was happening. This was not a coincidence. So a group of students, um, Ellis and I included, decided that after our delegation used Dan to go down to Sherman to see if we could find him because one of the purposes of the delegation was to physically hand him a copy of the petition, which at this point had over 500 signatures. Now it has like a hundred more. Um, and we, I had like a physical copy of the petition printed out. I was like, I don't want this to go to waste. We got to find this guy. So we go down to Sherman dining hall, um, and as we enter, we see him and he sees us um, and he immediately starts going out of like the emergency exit in the side of the dining hall. Um, and so Ellis, me, and then another student organizer follow after him. Um, and as we go through the door, the door like closed and like automatically locked after us. So all of our other student organizers that we were with were basically like separated from us back in the dining hall as we followed him into like the back kitchen area. Um, so he starts like going through the kitchen and we're just saying like very clearly like, hey, Clayton, like we have this petition. Can you please take it from us? We want you to look at it. Um, this like like we would really like we really want you to like talk to us you keep ignoring our meetings etc and the whole time he's just saying you're not allowed back here you're not allowed back here which isn't true because there's like multiple student clubs who use the kitchen um for like special events for cooking things for their club like students are allowed back in the kitchen under circumstances and so we keep following him and he goes back out into like the public dining hall area. We're still trailing him. Um, and at that, this point he kind of circles around and goes through another back door in our dining hall's kosher section. Um, and at that point, two other workers, um, not like catering workers, but like higher up administrative workers came and blocked us from uh, following him any further. Um, so at that point, I gave the petition to one of those workers who blocked us. I said, like, this is for Clayton. He refused to take it from us. Can you give it to him? I don't know if it actually ever got to him. Like, who, probably not. Um, but we did some chants and then we left. You know, we were kind of like, that was a bummer. Like, we really wish we could have given this to him. Um, and then we walked back up to used Dan Dining Hall to like reconvene to talk to some journalists who have been following this story. Um, a little plug, if you go to the Brandeis Justice, there's a few articles that have come out by some amazing journalists about this campaign, if you want to stay updated. Um, and as we are up there, we got a call from a worker um, saying that there had been police in Sherman Dining Hall, campus police, I want to be clear, not Waltham police. Um, who were asking around looking for us, um, who had been called by Clayton. And so we, at that point, um, you know, we are a group of student organizers. We are politically active. We are made up of a good portion of students of color. We did not feel safe putting our members in any situation where they could be questioned or harassed or targeted by the police. So we immediately left. Um, we weren't gonna risk a confrontation with them. Um, and so we dispersed and left campus. And that um, was our experience as student organizers trying to peacefully give a petition to a member of Harvest Table Administration. And just to add a little bit onto that, um, we later found out that Clayton when calling campus police lied about why we were there. Um, he didn't mention the petition at all, and he painted it as a group of students who just broke into the kitchen. He lied about um, us having access to knives, 
which really could have escalated things. Um, but for clarification, when we were in the kitchen, we were in the hallways far away from any sort of pots, pans, knives, anything. But the way that he made it seem, especially for the students of color present, could have been really dangerous because if campus police are considering if they're looking for a group of students that were potentially waving around knives, like that's their image of um, the group that we are, then they would come in to any interaction with these students with, um, with, with that mindset. So it would have been very dangerous for students of color. Exactly. Sure. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we later found out that the language that Clayton used when calling the police on us was that he felt um, physically threatened by our presence there, which, I mean, That's you can form your own opinion, but I don't consider ourselves very physically threatening. Um, and so that was like really interesting to hear. And like in the moment when we heard that the police were in Sherman and we decided to leave, um, we didn't know in the moment like what they thought, what they had been told, what they knew about the situation. And thank God we did leave as fast and as efficiently as we did because as Ellis said, in that moment, the cops had only heard one side of the story, which was that we were being aggressive and threatening. So mm -hmm. however that may have turned out if we hadn't left as we did, it could have been really bad. Aggressive Absolutely. and aggressive and threatening is a really interesting way to describe three 20 year olds walking behind you trying to hand you a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And why, and why you're on uh, this show right now and why I think like this is a issue we're talking about is that if this happened anywhere else in Waltham that wasn't in Brandeis, this would make the news very easily. <clears throat> But there seems to be a disconnect, and I've talked about it when we brought on uh, judge reporters uh, before on the show. There seems to be a disconnect and a mutual disconnect over Brandeis and Waltham. But I want people to realize that Brandeis is Waltham and Waltham is Brandeis. And what Brandeis residents are Waltham residents. And so I really want people to feel like you know we are one people. And so Brandeis issues are Waltham issues and Waltham issues are Brandeis issues. And so if a black union worker was fired anywhere else in Waltham, it would have been a much bigger story and your efforts would have been much more publicly publicized. So is there anything Waltham residents can do to help with this campaign? Um, for now, what would be really helpful is if Waltham residents um, helped sign our petition and spread the word to their neighbors and their friends and family. Um, I mentioned before that it was on the BLU link tree. Um, we have updates on this. This is definitely like a developing story. And so we post updates on the BLU Instagram. Um, a prolific Instagram. <laughs> thank you. Really just spreading the word and making it known that this is not only a member of the Brandeis community, but like Chris said, like those communities are integrated. Kevin's is also a member of the Waltham community. Um, a quick note, like, a quick, quick note is that Brandeis, uh, fun fact, is the largest employer of Waltham residents in the city. And so we forget these things sometimes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like one of BLU's missions from the beginning really has been to integrate students into the Waltham community and do service within the community. That's why we're so invested in continuously working with Food Not Bombs and getting to know community members in Waltham because we don't want to be isolated from Waltham. We can't, like we are in Waltham. Um, and so I do think it would be really powerful for Waltham residents to become aware of this story and to try to pressure Harvest Table into reinstating Kevin's um, because unfortunate as it is, like administration still sees us as students. Um, and this is my personal opinion, but I don't think they really respect us as community and political organizers very much. Um, 
And I think that that is like harmful to our campaign. And so I think spreading awareness, spreading the story of what happened um, is really critical. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to following the story, definitely uh, keeping track of it. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, and it's timely, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the COVID uh, response from Brandeis and how it, uh, mm -hmm. how it relates. Or to lack the thereof. Yeah, or lack thereof, uh, which is, I guess, uh, the spoiler. Um, but uh, the Waltham School Committee recently announced that uh, the COVID portal, uh, where you can find all the information and where it tracks all of the cases, um, is no longer going to be a thing anymore on the um, Waltham School Committee website. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's very little, if any, mandatory testing. Um, there's no transparency in how cases are coming anymore. Uh, the school committee essentially is just wringing their hands and saying COVID is over. Um, and I believe that Brandeis is doing similar things. Uh, if you would like to chat about that. Yeah, so Brandeis had something similar where they had a public database of all students who were in isolation um, and students who were um, socially like supposed to, who were close contacts. Um, and this was something that you could just look up and it would show up on the Brandeis website and everyone had an understanding of how many students there were on campus who were sick with COVID or who were isolating from COVID. But as of this semester, or I think as of the summer, they got rid of that. So there's very little transparency in who actually has COVID. We um, kind of have to guess who on campus has COVID from one of my friends has a really large lecture um, class and it's like a bio lab class and maybe 10% of that class at the beginning of the semester was out with COVID. And so you kind of have to use those numbers and resources to guess how many students have COVID, but it's not a great representation of like what um, what the university needs in terms of COVID resources and also how many students are actually sick. Yeah, it's it's pretty disappointing. Okay, well, first of all, this dashboard not only showed students, but it also showed faculty and staff. So it was very um, comprehensive. It gave us like a really good estimate of what was going on with camp on with COVID on campus. Um, and like all of the past two years, we had free rapid testing on Brandeis, at Brandeis, that was required of all students and staff. Um, it Like two years ago, it was three times a week, and then it dropped to two times a week, but still very consistent testing. We had isolated housing, so if you tested positive, you'd be moved out of your room into your own quarantine housing. Brandeis would provide like meals, they weren't great, but they would provide them. Um, and like, I used to like kind of brag about our COVID program. I'd be like, yeah, like my school sure isn't perfect, but we kind of got this COVID thing down. Like Brandeis had good numbers. I can't like lie about that. Like we were doing well. Um, and then as of this summer, uh, COVID's over. COVID, COVID is over. And all those resources have gone away. There is no isolation housing. So if you are in a dorm on campus and you have a roommate who tests positive, which side note, um, the freshman class of Brandeis is so large this year that the majority of freshman students are not only have one roommate, but are actually in triples. Mm -hmm. um, so and that's, they're in rooms built for two people but Brandeis has decided to pack them with three students instead. Um, and so, yeah, there is no testing unless you are like your roommate test positive, then you can, you have to like walk yourself to the health center and make an appointment for like days later to get a test done, but it's not made easy at all. You can't just like get a test if you want one, which was absolutely the case the last two years. Like, even if it you weren't like, even if your timer hadn't run out, if I was like, oh, I went out, I'm kind of nervous, I just want to get a test, I can do that, no issue. 
And in the past, there were, um, Jaden mentioned there were testing centers where we had to have mandatory, mandatory tests. Um, and they were located in upper campus and lower campus, so they were very accessible. It was they were in walkable, um, accessible locations. But now the testing center is the only place where you can get a COVID test, and it's down a steep hill, and it's very difficult for people with limited mobility or any like sort of physical disability. It it might be difficult to get to those locations, so that to the testing center. And our health center is only open Monday through Friday from 9 to 4 p.m. I think so during when people have classes, classes yeah. hours Hilarious. um and they're often like out of appointments so and so and so BLU uh is organizing around that as well yeah we're trying to um unfortunately like the dining campaign has been taking up a lot of our time and energy I will admit but um we currently have kind of like a makeshift mutual aid testing program um, where students who have tests, including us, um, Food Not Bombs Waltham really generously donated 15 COVID, rapid COVID tests to this program. We're like really grateful for that. Um, and so we have publicized to students that if, if you or if a friend or roommate are symptomatic, have COVID, think you have COVID, reach out and we will provide you tests. We will provide anything we can, you know, transportation, a bed. We literally had someone um, text us in the our like COVID chat just like a few hours ago. Hey, my roommate tested positive. I don't feel safe in my room. I left, I'm in the library currently. Is there anyone with a spare bed that I can sleep in tonight? And so we've been trying to like organize that just literally the past few hours. Um, and it's just like really ridiculous that this is something that students are having to do for ourselves when we are like paid to go to an institution that ensures us and our families that we will be safe and taken care for. Um, and that's just not happening at all. And there are students who are immunocompromised. There are students who are disabled, who it doesn't matter if Brandeis thinks COVID is over. Like there are students who, if they get COVID, will have a really bad time. And so mm. we're just doing whatever we can to help prevent that. But like I said, we're just students. We don't have tons of resources and so I guess ultimately our hope is that Brandeis brings back a testing program where students can access tests easily round the week, all like any time they need, um, and bring back isolated housing as well so that students aren't afraid of getting COVID because their roommate can't move out. Amazing work uh, you're doing with this. Um... And a, sh and a short anecdote that I wasn't planning on talking about, but I didn't realize that Brandeis was putting, was making doubles into triples when it, it's hilarious because at this very moment right now, uh, there's a master plan ward meeting, which doesn't mean anything to you guys, but we've been covering it a lot going on in wards five and six right now. And in six, uh, there's a famously a uh, campaign to uh, sanctify single family housing because there's a house of college students that are ruining the neighborhood because they're unmarried people living together and so they're literally trying to criminalize uh unmarried people living together and it's just so funny because you've got students that are being crammed into spaces and because of that they seek other places to live and the Waltham residents are trying to just criminalize that instead of just pressuring Brandeis to do what I think everyone wants, which is just build more student housing, build livable ding, ding, student ding. housing. So I'm actually in agreement with a lot of these Waltham residents talking about uh, this being a problem, but like they need to change the conversation into a not even just a more empathetic, but more probable one, because if they criminalize non-spousal living quarters then it's a slippery slope to a lot of terrible things um and we should just be pressuring brandeis to build more housing oh yeah no absolutely like i keep i keep saying like if brandeis is wanting to grow the population of the school and admit more students which 
like we said, we're seniors and every class that has been admitted since ours has been getting bigger and bigger, which that's fine. Like, you know, schools expand, that's natural, but you have to build the infrastructure for it. You can't keep growing your population and expecting that the same infrastructure that was built like decades ago is going to be able to maintain and hold that. It's just not going to be able to happen. And like Chris, like you said, the more that housing becomes unpredictable and cramped on campus, more students are going to be moving into Waltham. So like we've already discussed, this isn't just a Brandeis problem. This is a Waltham problem because it will start affecting the city. And maybe it's not very noticeable yet, but I promise you, like when this freshman class are juniors and seniors and they start moving off campus and they start getting cars, you're going to see a change in Waltham City as well. So please, like Waltham residents, pressure Brandeis into building more housing. We really need it and accessible housing on that. It's so unfortunate because it's not like Brandeis doesn't have the endowment or doesn't have mm -hmm. the funds to build nice housing. We literally have a dorm that everyone complains about. It's infamous on campus. It's built in a ditch. And when it rains, all the rainwater goes down there. There are cockroaches, there are bugs, there are smells in that dorm. And yet we can't, Brandeis somehow can't afford to upgrade it or build better dorms for students. And yet our president can have um, a salary increase every year. Of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Not increase of a million dollars, a salary of a million dollars. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, I think this is all great. Um, love BLU. Do you guys want to chat about um, anything else you got going on? What else do we have going on? I, I think that that's kind of the main two things we've been focusing on this year yeah. so far. Um, but Chris, thanks for having us on. And we would love to come back, hopefully, when this with good news dining campaign has better outcomes please i really hope maybe we can that. come back with kevin's once he's rehired That's yes yes that'll be awesome <laughs> i'm looking forward to that well thank you very much for coming on thank you <laughs> thank you